Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and today I'm at the 2019 Pacific Northwest Writers Conference with author Damon Swade, author of Verbalize. Damon, welcome to Author. Thank you so much for having me here today, Bill. It's been a great day already, and I bet it's going to get better. So you have led a long and interesting life, indeed, Damon, and uh, it's ended up involving writing. It didn't start out that way, although usually writers always write in some form. So back when you're doing all this different stuff to make a living the way young people have to, um, and the way a lot of writers have to, what was the writer doing? I was wrote, he writing? I wrote my you whole were life. Always writing, even the, as a little guy. Even as a little guy, I was a talker. I was raised in a family of lawyers, and I read 1,200 words a minute, and I wrote very fast. And I was such a loudmouth. I had to write, or I was going to get beaten to death with a brick because I talked too much. And so. I wrote constantly. I was always sort of, I was a, a massive reader. I went through libraries very quickly. <laughs> and so I always wrote. And I was a child actor who then became a teenage actor who then realized that it was blue collar work. And as I sort of migrated out of performance, I realized like I was always telling someone else a story. I'd been a musical theater kid my whole life, but I wanted to go into theme park design. I almost went to what? college, to hotel management school. That's what you do if you want to work at Disney or whatever. You go to Ithaca, to Cornell, because they have one of the best in the country, okay. and University of Houston is the other. Well, I'm from Houston. I'm never going to go and be <laughs> at University of Houston. And I, was cert I went to Ithaca to look at the college, and they also call it suicide, like suicide you, because you're up in the middle of nowhere. And everyone commits suicide because it's so horrifying and bleak and alone. And so nice. it's like a Scandinavian noir novel. I was like, I'm not going to kill myself in the snow. I cannot live at home. I guess I'm not going to work in theme park. See, but you were, the, I always think of it that we create our lives like this. We have a vision, which is theme park, but you were seeing, you were really thinking theater. What I was thinking was entertainment. Right, I wanted but you, that was the only them. thing you had in your mind. I was a kid. My mother had done legal right. work for the Disney Corporation, so every summer for 12 years, I lived at Disneyland and Disney World for three months. But so I learned how all the pieces fit together. And for me, I, my family's a jewelry family, and when I was a little boy, I would smash watches and take them apart and then put them back together. And it wasn't enough to just put the pieces back, I wanted it to tick. And so for me, I wanted to take everything apart and then put it back together and make it tick. And so it's that Aristotelian biology So thing. do you feel, as a, so as a writer, do you, because you know, we think of, because you're always, I write nonfiction now, but you're writing fiction, and so you're starting with you're having to have it grow and come together, but do you feel like a part of you is smashing something apart and pulling it back together? Everything I ever do. You feel always. like every, it's, and what, everything. But, so if you're writing a story, so I, I, I believe you, but teach me about what is being smashed apart when you tell a story, which you have to grow from theoretically nothing. The right? reader. The reader. the reader is being smashed Absolutely. apart. Absolutely. Oh so? my God. How do you I smash wanna, the reader well, so, apart? Uh, so, I, I, so I come at writing from sort of a strange thing. I came from film and television and theater and comics. And so when I first came in, this is actually how I wound up doing Verbalize, is I had this very strange approach because for me it was an audience. I was always thinking of living people out in the dark responding. I wasn't, a, I'm not an introvert. I don't have any problem talking to people. I'm very confrontational. For me, a book was like, there's a line from Kafka. He says, a book is an ax for the frozen sea within us. And I want to be oh. that ax. <laughs> I want to get out and hack them apart. And so for me, every time I pick up a character, every time I look at the actions of a character, I'm thinking, how is that going to split the pinata open? How is it going to get the candy out of them? Because what a reader does is breathe, right? What an audience does is breathe. Laughter is breathing. Screaming is breathing. Sighing is breathing. Right. The word punctus, literally, the word punctuation comes from punctus, which means point. It's where you breathe when you're reading aloud, when the monks are transcribing, the, punctu the puncti are where you breathe. What you want your reader to do is laugh at the right moment, cry at the right moment, orgasm at the right moment, scream at the right, sigh. The breathing together is what makes an audience cohere, but that's also with books. But, yeah, but you know, it's, it's fascinating because Jerry Seinfeld said, to me the biggest nightmare is writing a book. Because all someone comes up and does, does is, comes up and says, hey, I read your book, liked it. And away they go. I don't get the applause. I don't get the laugh. I don't get the, and I it's used to do performing drug. and I and I love that too. But there, it's, you're, you're having the experience with the reader, but it is almost psychic. Because you're not there with them. The thing is, <laughs> I, so I obviously am not an introvert. I have no attention needs that are not met by my life. I have always got fans that are standing of, outside the door. Really? I've always got people. Yes, I'm up Most to, writers don't. I am up to 39 fan tattoos, meaning people who have my names and my my name and my covers tattooed on their bodies. I have people that wow. show up at my house. I have people that have chased me through hotels. I have been carried out of cabs. So for me, I like having a barrier. I like, okay, so and yeah. every fandom is different. My friend Eloisa James writes historical romance. and. Um, we were talking at one point, and she was like, I want more fans like you. 
And I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, your fans are younger and browner and cooler. And she was like, and they show up with like pierced lips and they have like wacky tattoos. And I'm like, yes. And she's like, mine are like gentle 70 year old women who cry over their walkers from three <laughs> yards away. And she's like, yours climb over the table and like offer you their children. And I said, every fandom is different. Every author yeah. is, because it's voice, right? I always say like your brand is your voice made visible. Like no it. one looking yeah. at me thinks that I write inspirational romance. No one looking at me thinks I write middle grade kid books, right? I yeah. am my brand. My brand is my voice made visible. But I also think that your voice, I talked about this today in my character class, your voice is from your void. It's the thing that hurt you in your past, the wound that you carry, the errors well, in your life. That's interesting. You think it's, you your think it's, void yeah. speaks yeah. through your voice. And so everything that makes you who you are, all your scars and bruises and lumps and mistakes come out of your mouth. And that's what readers want. They come to you for pain transmuted into beauty. When did you become the, are you the president of the of I am RW? the president elect of Romance Writers okay. of America. All right, so you're a gay man who's the president elect of the Romance Writers of America. I would not have thought no. I would ever say those words. No, it's a very strange story. So what, what the so, hell? All right, so. First of all, I have to say, I didn't even know there was gay romance. I mean, it makes sense, but I just, I, because it's I saw huge. one image. Okay, well, it's sure. It's huge. But I didn't know, but there is, obviously. Giant. Uh, and uh, how long have you been writing it? Um, I, my first romance came out in 2011. I wrote okay, it. Okay, so not even that long. No. How I, long has that genre really been, like, really been around where it's a The first gay romance that hit the New York Times was in 1970. It was The Lord Won't Mind. It was number one for 16 Seriously? Weeks. Yeah. Here's another weird fact. The average gay romance author, their readership is 90% straight women, 10% men. What? And what we realized is, I think that gay romance is not about LGBTQ people. I think gay romance is about women exploring power and gender and desire in a context in which everyone has agency. It's anti-patriarchal because suddenly Everybody's, everyone can hold the door. Anyone can be right. on top. Anyone picks up the check. And so it's not really about gay dudes any more than vampires. It's, it's really just a about. relationship where there's no one where Everyone more... has power. And so automatically, oh, that's you take, and I believe that what romance is about oh. is about male emotional vulnerability in heterosexual romance. Well, that's true. I talked to a romance author who said, the, she said she felt the man was the most important character. Male emotional vulnerability. He, we needed him to be Here's interesting. One of the big, do you know what the hardest genre, uh, the hard, hardest niche to sell in romance right now? Lesbian romance. Not because people don't want to read about two women, it's because there's no dude to be vulnerable. And most they're people, both vulnerable and that's and just so how they are. And so the cultural, the patriarchy sets it that's up. It's true, because the man, he has to break through that. Mm -hmm. and it's true. And I, and by you, I was yes. properly humbled. No, that's I, what Darcy says, right? So by you, I was properly humbled. What you're looking for is the place that you can crack the dude open like a pinata. We're back to the ax in the frozen sea, right? right? You're cracking them open. So if I start a book, what I'm like is, how do I get the candy out? There's right. candy in the reader. How do right. I get the feelings out? Right. I want them to get erectile tissue. I want them to ooze and bleed right. and sweat and piss, right. but I've got to get it out of them. Right. I need a big stick. All right, so what is your vision? How are you gonna save the Romance Writers of America. What is your vision they don't for it? Need Do you saving. have one? It's actually, it's still the largest genre in the world. We make more money than everybody else almost combined. I mean, it's, it's such a viable genre because it is the, it's the or genre. Every genre on earth came from romance. Within that, yeah. Everything. Yeah. Gothic leads to mystery. Scientific romance leads to sci-fi. High, high romance leads to fantasy. Everything comes from romance. The deal is romance is evolving more rapidly than people know. And romance is often the vanguard. Romance is where ebooks burst out first. Yeah. Self-published. Bursts out first. This is also where things like serial fiction and, and transmedia and video game adaptations and comic books. And so, like, I think RWA has to look to the future. I someone said to me, they were like, "What is your vision for RWA?" And I don't become president until next year, so I'm 12 months out. But really, my vision is: I believe everyone deserves a place at the table. Everybody, every author who is writing a romance novel deserves a chance to do well. That doesn't mean they get to do well. Right. It means they deserve the opportunity. It also means everybody has to step it up. We got work to do. All of us. And everyone can be doing better. We can write better books. We can build bigger fan bases. Every bestseller on earth was created by word of mouth. Every bestseller yep. on earth was created out of word of mouth from non-readers. And I mean Peyton Place, Interview with the Vampire, Gone with the Wind. Great book about, uh, called, it's a terrible title, called Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, which is about the editor, the writing, the editing, and the marketing of Gone with the Wind, which created a juggernaut. One book, her only book, and the entire marketing campaign is laid out. That didn't happen by accident. Margaret Mitchell was a very smart woman. Ditto if you look at Lovely Me, which is about Jacqueline Suzanne. Again, a popular success. She sold her first, entire first print run out of the back of a Chrysler, driving around the Tri-State area signing books because they couldn't be returned. She was doing that as a marketing, it, it's all, so anytime wow. people say like, oh, the golden days when Fitzgerald waited and drank cocktail, bullshit. They were all working authors. Jane Austen, working author. Dickens, working author. Gaskell, working author. But I think future-wise, looking down the road, I think all 
all writers have to take responsibility for their own success. You have to. This is a job. Yeah. It is an art, it is a skill, and it is a job. And I've been doing this job for all 30 years. So I love it. I love words. I, I think that words can build worlds. And if, and if you can embrace that power and take responsibility, that means you have to take responsibility for the failures too. And I think that's part of moving forward. It's saying like, that sucked, let's do better.